jewelry, right? Some kind of long, maybe a, a, a watch on a, on a long chain. Um, nice hairdo. What's that? <laughs> Good hairdo. <laughs> right, the hairdo. Notice that, I mean, to me, to my eye anyway, I mean, it's her hair. It's not, it's not a marriage wig, right? And she's got a bow in the back, a satin bow. And we can see from, if I get the right note, I will get to him in a minute. Um, there, you can see it. Right? Satin bow, some maybe lace or a comb in the back, another bow in the front, some kind of um, jewelry here, and also, you know, uh, yeah, tough look. <laughs> tough look. Uh, I, 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 teach, I teach several courses on memoirs and memory to my students, and we, they read the whole, I've translated the whole thing, and they've, they've read the whole thing, uh, which is a very interesting experience. Um, and then at some point I brought in these pictures, and one of them, <laughs> said, you know, scary, scary looking. She just scary looking. But anyway, this is Pauline Vengroff. So um, she wrote memoirs that were published in German, largely in German. They're largely in German with there's some Yiddish, there's some Hebrew, a little bit of Polish, no Russian. And they were published in, in Berlin the first time in 1908. And then they were republished with a second volume in 1910, and then it was published again in 1913, and then it was published again in 1919, it was published in 1921. She died in 1916, so several of these editions are posthumous, and several of them came out while she was alive. So it's an extraordinary publication history. Yeah. Clearly, yeah, she was doing something that interested people. Publishing. Who would have been the audience for her memoir? Well, that's one of my big questions, because they were clearly massively popular. Um, Jews, certainly, but not only. She, she published them in German. I'm still grappling with what she wrote them in. Um, but I think she wrote them largely in German, too. Uh, those, I have some original material that's Russian. But um, German Jews, and also German non-Jews, apparently, and Jews in the pale of a certain type. We'll get, we'll get to that, but that's an excellent question. You know, somebody writes, who's the audience? Who's, who's our intended audience? who is in her mind, who all of us, if we write, we have some intended audience in mind, and who's the actual audience, and why? what accounts for the incredible popularity of this, this work. How common was it in, in Germany for female memoirs to be published and republished, or, or male memoirs even, for that matter, at this point in time? The only previous memoir in the history of Jewish writing by a woman that got published Glickle. was Glickel. They were, those were published in 1898, and hers are published 10 years later. Um, so, and a Glickel will assemble, you, how many people are familiar with some, some yeah, 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 great, you have it. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so she's a 17th century woman who wrote um, something that she did not title. The, when they were published, they were given the title Zechreinus. Mm -hmm. What? Zechreinus in Yiddish means memoirs, memories, memories, memoirs. Um, they were written entirely for personal consumption, for the reading of her own family. They were never intended for a public audience. She would be shocked and I contend scandalized that people sh that were outside her family circle, never mind non-Jews, are reading this and picking over them. Um, but they're an extremely, extremely important source for Jewish history altogether. And for women's writing, they are really the only full-fledged thing we have until this. And then we have her. Um, so that's several centuries later, and it is extraordinary. So it raises all kinds of questions. I mean, what's going on in her mind that she has the audacity to do such a thing? And I'll get to you, and I'll describe what she does in a minute and how it's different from what Lickle did. Um, and she intends them for publication from the outset. That's very clear to me. And she gets them published. So right away, that's a very different mentality than Glickle, um, who's, who's very traditional. The question with Vengeroff is precisely gauging, um, is she traditional? Is she modern? Is she somewhere in between the two? And you'll see, uh, I'm not going to answer it. Um, I'm going to give you some of what she has to say, and then we'll open it up, and you'll tell me what you think. Um, but certainly, in that kind of mentality, in writing, intending it for be, to be for a public, she's 
different right away from what I said about, about Glickel, and that, that in and of itself is certainly a, a modern kind of consciousness. So, Van Gogh writes these two volumes, and it's clear to me that she writes volume one with volume two on its heels already. It, you know, she writes in volume two, oh, I was so delighted with the reception that I sat down. B.S. I mean, she had, she had it already. Um, and she is clearly a woman of tremendous ego and self-confidence with reason. She's very, very bright. She's a fantastic writer. Um, she's a very acute social observer. And she knew that she had something that would be of immense interest. Um, so it's not surprising to me. She also, the way she ends volume one is no way to end a volume. She, it's, it's, a, it's a segue to clearly to, us, to the, here's the next part. So she's a woman, as you saw already even from the photographs of her, of tremendous ego strength and uh, self-consciousness and self-confidence. Self so what does she do in these memoirs? In the first of them, um, and she just called, she, by the way, the title of this is called Memoirs of a Grandmother. Mm. And then the subtitle is Scenes from the Cultural History of the Jews in Russia in the 19th Century. So it's a very interesting title. Memoirs of the Grandmother leads you to think, what are you going to be reading? I'm asking. What, do you, what would you expect? About her family, 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 about her children, you know, the diapers and the feeding and the food. Right. OK. So you expect these kind of very heimish, you know, stuff. What do you do then when she, when she modifies the first, the, the title with the subtitle? And it, which is, again, scenes from the cultural history of the Jews of Russia in the 19th century. It's kind of dirty, then. Yeah. I'm thinking of the uh, publisher to whom she presents first what ends up being the subtitle, <laughs> saying to her, nobody's going to buy this. You've got to have something that's going to be more appealing to the masses. So she says, OK, memoirs of a grandmother. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's <coughs> possible that it came that way. Or that she herself sensed that, I mean, what is her authority to write, author, right? What's her authority to write? Um, I compare her in, in my work about her, given, again, she's born in 1813, she dies, 1833, she dies in 1916. That is the, the period of the Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment. And one of the char characteristic features of the Maskilim, the practitioners of Haskalah, the Enlightenment, was that they wrote memoirs. They created a genre of Jewish, modern Jewish memoir writing and autobiography. It started with Solomon Maimon, who wrote memoirs. He was contemporary and a student of uh, Moses Mendelssohn, so 18th century figure. And then he, his memoirs, which are scandalous and funny and outrageous, and critique traditional society and depict the odyssey of a Polish boy from a brilliant Polish boy from a Jewish backwater, very poor family, who is literally dying for enlightenment, leaves Poland, can't wait to get out of there on foot, and goes to Germany and, and encounters and endures all kinds of hardships because he, he needs enlightenment like people need air to breathe. 